Amen. 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 God bless you today. Today we sing praises to the Lord. Today we sing praises to the Lord because He is worthy to be praised. Happy New Year to all of you. If I hadn't said it once, I'll, I'll say it now. And if I said it once, I'll say it again. Happy New Year. We uh, are here today because of the goodness of God, first of all. We realize it is not about us, it's about Him. Amen. I don't know, I don't care how technologically advanced your long clock is. <laughs> You're here because God woke you up this morning. Amen. And so today we sing praises to the Lord who has delivered us. Who has delivered us out of 2015 and brought us into 2016. Out of one year into the next, who in spite of our many shortcomings, right. and they are many, many, in spite of uh, our sin, he has held back the punishment that was due us. Amen. Because no one in this room can say that you are here because you deserve to be here. There's right. no one under the sound of my voice who can dare make the claim that you are righteous in us to have audience with Almighty and Holy God. That's right. So we sing praises today. Why? Because we understand uh, that God is gracious. God is merciful. And that mercy shows itself in the fact that we are still here. Right. The purpose of this lesson today is that when we look back, that we can see the grace and mercy of God. Stay with me now. Just take a moment, a moment of contemplation, a moment of reflection. Oh, yes, he has been good. All right. Oh, yes. All right. Did you need more time? All right. Yeah. Did you need more time? All right. Yes, he's good. I had a conversation on New Year's Day with our beloved sister, Ard. And we were talking and talking, and she said, Brother Mary, well, you know what happened to me last night? She said, a little bit after midnight. <laughs> she said, a car ran into my car and knocked it into the house. Oh, wow. oh yes, she did. And we said and we laughed about it. <laughs> when I say we laughed, not that it was not a tragic situation, right, right. but she was still here. Amen. She can say, see, God teaches us how to say hallelujah anyhow. Anyway, so your being here today, again, is not about you. It's about him. And we sing praises to him today. Amen. We acknowledge him. And we say today, thank you, Lord, for my deliverance. Thank you for bringing me a mighty, mighty own way. Amen. And we, as we look back, we can see the grace and mercy of God that he has carried us through the tough times. We don't. We dare not think that we are here because of our own ingenuity, our own intellect, our own goodness, our own privilege. His presence and activity in our lives should invoke a response from us. His goodness and his mercy, his loving kindness in your life are to, are to invoke, are to spur us on to praise and adoration to Almighty God. And so I'm here and I feel like celebrating today. I feel like celebrating because I can look back and see how God has brought me to this point. And I can, through the eyes of faith, look forward and see that he has more for me to accomplish, more for me to experience in terms of his goodness, his loving kindness, but also in terms of my consecration and dedication to him. So today, we understand that his activity Brings forth praise and dedication. Mm -hmm. Praise and dedication. Yeah. And you see, I want us to now, as we have looked back, and we have begun to, to grasp the full import of God's love, how he has brought us, brought us out in spite of ourselves, brought us to a point now we can now able, we're able to look forward we're able to look as we begin to walk along, as Isaiah said, the king's highway. Yeah. 
The king's highway is called a, a highway of holiness. The sinner and the wayward will not travel there. Only the redeemed is able to walk along this highway. You see, it is a highway of mercy. It's a highway of grace. A highway of holiness. Our salvation does not uh, deter us from celebrating. No, it motivates us to celebrate. Mm -hmm. You see, when we are able to walk along this road, we understand that it's not a road that we can walk without the grace and the assistance of God. That's right. You see, he made us holy in the beloved. It is Christ who has uh, given us his garment of righteousness that we may discard the garments of sin. Wow. I want to look at, at the theme. As we look at this psalm, the 30th division of the book of Psalms, we see a psalm of dedication. A psalm of dedication because as David uh, looked back and he saw how God had lifted him up. And even though God had lifted him up, sometimes like you and I, we begin to forget Amen. what God has done. That's right. You see, sometimes, I don't know about you, but we can get cocky mm -hmm. in our righteousness. Mm -hmm. We can become arrogant mm -hmm. in our saveness. Mm -hmm. We can sometimes take for granted the fact that God has delivered us. We begin to live lives as, we, as though we delivered ourselves. We call that self-righteousness. And so in order for us to understand something of what's going on in the psalmist's heart as he writes the third division of the book of Psalms, I want to invite you to take a journey with me through uh, the corridors of time. And we're going to look at 2 Samuel, the 24th chapter, as well as its companion uh, passage, which is 1 Chronicles uh, 21. Now, the Bible helps us to understand that God had blessed David. He'd given him peace. Mm -hmm. He'd given him strength and power. And he reigned yeah. over Israel. But you see, sometimes when God gives us peace, He gives us stability, He gives us the assurance of His presence in our lives, He gives us everything that we need. We, like David, can become overly confident. And so David began to, he dispatched his captain, Joab. And he said, Joab, I want you to go and, and number all the fighting men of Israel. And Joab said, Lord, not so. Is not God able to make thousands out of one? You see, it's not about how many soldiers you have when you're on the Lord's side. <coughs> You see, when you're in the army of God, it does not matter how much military might you may have. God is the one who may able to fight your battles. God is the one who may able to give you the victory. And we ought to praise him and rejoice because of the victory that we have in Jesus Christ. But no, 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 David said, go out and number all the fighting men. And so, uh, Joab obeyed the king. And in Israel, uh, they counted some 800,000 fighting men. In uh, Judah, they counted some 500,000 fighting men, almost a million and a half soldiers. And then after the end of the count, the Bible says uh, David's heart afflicted him. Oh, yes. In other words, his conscience began to do a number on him. He realized that he was putting his confidence in his own strength. He was putting his confidence in his might and his military uh, ingenuity. And then God sent the prophet 
He sent the prophet to him, Dan. He sent the prophet. And uh, before, and I'm going to tell you this right here. See, God will work on your heart. It's not about how good the preacher preach. It's not about how good the singer sing. It's not how eloquent the read or read the scripture. No, God can work it before the preacher even shows up. God is already working in your life. He's already taking you through situations. You know what I'm talking about. You know you had situations in your life right now. You probably went through some stuff last night. I ain't know nothing about it. But you say, he preaching about me. No, God is convicting your heart. See, God can, through his providential guidance, you know, help you to see yourself in situations and know that you need Jesus. So therefore, even the Bible says that David couldn't sleep that night. Tossed and turned. See, his conscience was convicting him. Knowing that he had stepped out of the bounds of what God wanted him to do. And so therefore, when the prophet came, uh, the prophet said, uh, I'm going to give you a choice. And this right here helps us understand how good God is. We're going to get into this in our message. I just want you to understand where we're going with. Make a long story very, very short. Uh, he had a choice between three punishments. He said in First Chronicles, he said, you can have either three years, three years of famine, yeah. or three months of being defeated by the enemy, mm -hmm. being in a hot pursuit by the sword, or three days, <laughs> three days of pestilence, and the judgment of the sword of the Lord. Now you choose. See, God even shows mercy in his judgment. God who is sovereign, God who has the right to give him all of those calamities, if he chooses. He gives us volition. He gives us choice. See, you guys messed up before. Yeah, you messed up. Don't even lie to your eyes. We get that. You messed up. Because we all mess up. But you see, God still is gracious. He's still merciful. See, mercy seems, simply means that, what's a good way to say mercy? He holds back. He restrains. He holds back the punishment that is due you. That's right. That's right. Because of sin, we all uh, are the benefactors of the wages of sin. Yeah, but he holds back the punishment. He gives you grace. He gives you mercy. Not that you deserve it, because he's so precious. That's why we praise him today. Not because I made it through. Yeah, you might be a hard fighting soldier, but you can't even pick up the sword if it's not for the grace of God. And so therefore... He chose the third one. The three days of pestilence. I don't know if he knew what he was getting into. But the Bible said the angel of the Lord came down and slew 70,000 men in Israel. And then turned his face toward Jerusalem. And began to bring a great slaughter. And then God looked out and he said to the angel, stay in here. He gave a reprieve. He relented. All the while David was praying, all the priests had sackcloth and ashes. He prayed to God said, and David said, it's me, I'm the one who sinned. I'm the one who is guilty of this uh, atrocity against you, God. Not these sheep. Not these who had no decision making uh, in the matter. Helps us understand that your sin can have consequences on other folk. Oh yes, many of us are in a situation that we're in right now. Not because of our doing, but because of somebody else. Sin is universal. It, it, its implications run deep. Your, your, your failing to do what you're supposed to do can cause problems for your yet unborn generations. And your folly in doing stuff that you know better than to do can also result in generational curses. The consequences of your sin has universal implications. We as a people, we as the, the Lion Street family, we have to understand our failure to, to launch out into the deep will have an impact on others in terms of coming into our family and how they act while they're here. Let's understand that. 
as we move into our text. The 30th division of the book of Psalms, as I said, it's a, it, it's, a, it's, it's a psalm of dedication. And dedication comes after praise and adoration. Notice, the first thing I want to share in this psalm is the fact that we collectively as a people, we ought to be able to say, we lift up our hearts to God. We lift thee up on high. We extol you to God. He says, I will, this is David speaking, I will extol or lift up. Lift thee up, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up and hast not made my souls to rejoice over me. O oh my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. O oh Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave. Thou hast kept me alive, that I should not go down to the pit. Sing unto the Lord, O oh ye saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. For his anger endures but a moment. Uh, in his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night. But joy comes in the morning. In other words, the Lord, number one, is high, even in his name. He is the highest. We ought to understand that God is the highest. There is none beside him, nor is there any like him. He dwells in the height and holy place. He is above the angels. He is above all men. He is above all other so-called gods. He is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. Oh, yes, he is. He cannot be higher than he already is. Yeah. In other words, uh, whether you trust him or not does not make him any more or any less God. Yeah. Yeah. He's God all by himself. Yeah. He rules by himself. He doesn't need you to be more God. And so therefore, we understand that when we say we extol him, when we say we lift him up, it's not that we're elevating God any more than he can be elevated. No, it's not like that at all. What we're doing, we're simply declaring him to be what he is. See, when you lift up God, you're just saying, yes, I acknowledge you for who you are. Uh, I acknowledge you for what you do. I acknowledge you as the great I am. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a wonderful thing to be able to praise God. It's a wonderful thing to be able to acknowledge him, to extol him, to lift him up. Oh, yes. You, the psalmist, is saying, I give you the highest praise. I give you the highest praise, and I determined to do so for the following reasons. Are you ready for this? Ready to get your praise on now? You need to have some reasons. First of all, I praise God today for his deliverance. He's able to deliver you from danger. He's able to lift you up out of the pit. To lift you up out of the pit simply means it's, it's like to draw you out of the well. You're in a hole that you can't get out of. And you need someone, you need somebody who's able to pick you up. And God is the one who's able to lift us up out of the pit. Well, how do you see this pit? Well, you're in the pit of your sin. You're in the pit of your misery. You're in the pit of being unconverted. You're in the pit of being lost without Christ. And therefore, His graciousness. His loving kindness shows up when you're feeble and can't do it on your own. You ought to praise him, knowing that he brought you from a mighty long way. I lift him up. I extolled him because of what he's done. Uh, he's delivered my soul from danger. He's not allowed uh, my enemies to rejoice over me. Do you know that Satan, Satan rejoices and he delights in your calamity. Oh, he had, a, he had a good time. He does. Satan rejoices. He laughs. And he's just tickle pink when we struggle. When fallen man, when we're groping in darkness, having wars against one another, killing one another, uh, disenfranchising one another, Satan, he delights in that. He delights in our sin. And therefore, the children of Satan, they delight in the calamity of the church. When the church struggles, the world delights. You see, when, when you hear about the latest scandal about this preacher 
or that creature has done this, that, or the other. It gives the unredeemed an opportunity to say that Christianity is not authentic. It's not real. They may look and present me as exhibit A because of my scandal, because of my waywardness. Understand, uh, your enemies will delight in your calamity. But you see, God's not going to allow that. God wants to lift you up. He wants to pick you up. He wants to, as he did with Israel, take you out of the mire, uh, the mud and the, and the cesspool of sin and clean you up, wash you up, and adorn you with the ornaments of righteousness. He wants to bless you. He wants to make you a blessing. And so that when the world looks and sees that city on the hill, they see us as victorious folk, victorious people. And to that, they begin to stream into the family of God. See, God has so positioned you to be successful. And if you are not successful, go back and look at your habits. Go back and look at what you are, the principles that you are applying in your life. You see, Christianity has to be real and relevant. Not only to you, but to those who view you. They don't see the realness and the genuineness of your faith. Why should they want to be a part of that faith? Right. Think about it. Think about it. Notice uh, in this psalm, the psalmist says, uh, O Lord God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. Right. See, not only would he not allow uh, your enemies to rejoice over your father and your fall, he says he hears and he's able to rescue you. The Bible says we ought to confess our faults one to another. See, when we confess to God, when we agree with God, when we cry out to the Lord, God says, I can heal you. I can pick you up. See, when we run around here, let me use another word, when we strut around here, as though we are all of that, as though we've already you know, reached the zenith of righteousness, okay? We don't confess before God. We don't cry out to God. We don't come to God. We don't petition God with prayer and supplication. And when God does not respond to us, we look around and say, why are you, why are you not here? Right. When you want something, you got a guy on speed dial. <laughs> but when you, when you get what you want, you lose the number. Right. And God trying to contact you, you got to go call an ID. <laughs> like I got you, like they have a meal sometimes. <laughs> oh, yes. But you see, uh, not only do we praise him because he delivered us from danger, but we also, uh, because we behold his holiness and we remember his holiness towards us. Notice, he said, I'll sing, and he asked the whole congregation to join and give him thanks in remembrance of his holiness, how he has delivered, how he has now made us holy. It is an imputed or a conferred holiness. Not a holiness based on our merit, based on our performance, but based on his graciousness. You know, God is good. You know, God is gracious towards us. And, you know, as we grasp the fullness of his goodness, it brings a change in our life. You see, calling, he calls on all saints to give thanks. You see, Pardoning grace. Pardoning grace. If you remember the body of Christ, you understand what I'm talking about when I say pardoning grace. Because of his grace, you have been pardoned. Man. Yes, you've been pardoned. Reminiscent of a person who's ready to go to the chair or to receive a lethal injection. And at 11, 59, and 45 seconds, the phone rings. And it's the governor. He says, I want to stay the execution. I want to give him a pardon. And that person who knows he's only seconds away from death, he now knows he has a new lease on life. He ought to act like he's grateful. Right. He ought to have some praise in his heart, Amen. a song on his lips, Amen. calling on the Lord, giving thanks because he's been pardoned. He's been justified. He's been declared righteous. 
He's been adopted. Yes. He now has eternal life. Yes. And therefore, he says, thank you, Lord. Amen. We who are the Lord's are set apart for his purposes. You've been delivered from the rest who are still walking in darkness. You've been delivered not to boast in your deliverance. You pray God for your deliverance. But then, uh, as he brings you across the River Jordan, you ought to stop and build an altar. You ought to stop and build an altar. Man. Build an altar and use that altar to worship and praise God, but also to dedicate yourself to him. Yeah. And that's what David did when the dead angel was going uh, throughout uh, Jerusalem and he stayed in his hand. The Bible says, David and all the priests who were in sackcloth and ashes, they immediately, they went to a certain man and bought an area of land where the Lord had stopped his onslaught. And right there, the Bible says, they built an altar and worshipped. Coming out of that dreadful situation, they worshipped. Coming out of that situation where thousands had died because of David's sin, they began to worship. See, when you have come out of some mess, and you still smell the, the smoke of that fire that God pulled you out of, right. do you have the wherewithal to stop and to praise God? You lost your house. People in, 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 in the Midwest, uh, further west from us, in all of the tornadoes and floods, and they, they, they lost it all. Some of them begin to just pray and praise God. Can you do that? Oh, you mad, God. I'm not going to serve you. I'm not even going to come to church no more. It seemed like everything was going fast for me. But when I became a Christian, it seemed like all hell broke loose. And now I'm thinking about going back into the world. <coughs> notice. Notice we praise him because of his holiness. It is imputed to his saints. We praise him because uh, we're confident in his readiness to save. Sometimes we don't receive the blessings because we don't ask for the blessings. You may have to be like Jonah in the very pit of your despair before you cry out to the Lord. When the, when the Lord delivers you, see, he, del he wanted to deliver you a long time ago. Sometimes we wallow. And we remain in our discomfort. We remain broken. We remain dysfunctional. We remain uh, pathetic. Because we don't cry out to the Lord. But when we do, the Bible says he's able, willing and ready to give mercy to us. You see, the Bible tells us that he, even, even his anger is momentary. See, when, when, when you have to scold your children, you may be angry with them. But you see, behind that anger is love. Oh, you see this? It's love. And you see, when, when God had to punish, <laughs> had to punish David, he gave him a choice. Showing judgment mixed with mercy. But not only that, uh, he wanted to teach uh, David, not to rely on his own ability. See, when you rely on your own ability, your own ability, ability can only get you so far. Right. But you see, you can never reach what God wants you to have if you're doing it based on your own ability. When you trust in yourself, you say, I don't need to trust in you, God. Let's look and understand the implications of this thing. It's, it's not simply, you know, I just want to count all the people. Some say he wanted to count all these folks because he wanted to raise the taxes. Maybe. But the bottom line is he was not trusting in God. Not only that, his, his lack of trust and regard for God would cause the whole nation, the whole nation, to lose uh, their dependence on God. And so therefore, even though he had missed it, the Bible tells us that God uh, still gave him another shot. Now watch this. What he wanted this, David to say is, now I understand that I will make you first. Can you say that? 
Can you say that you're making God first? I will make you, I would, I don't want to use the word make. I will view you as supreme. God, I give you my all in all. You're supreme in my thoughts. You're supreme in my affections. You're uh, supreme in how I behave myself. He will be elevated in my praise, as David said. Life, we ought to say that God will be elevated in our praise yeah. and dedication. Mm -hmm. See, we are in 2016 for a reason. As we look forward, we understand that uh, we've been privileged to come through some stuff. Oh yes, we, we've come through some stuff. And because you've come through some stuff, you may have gotten through it by the skin of your teeth. But you've come through some stuff. You know, you may have come through some stuff, you know, looking pretty good. Oh, 2015 was a good year for some. But it was a very tragic year for others. Right. Some of us have experienced uh, plenty. And some have experienced lack. Some of us, you know, we, we, we had loved ones who we have dear. And we miss them. Notwithstanding, God has left us here for a purpose. There are, there are thousands of, of, of others who need to know the goodness of Christ. And they will know the goodness of Christ through us. If we look back and grasp the fact that God has delivered us for the purpose of affecting the deliverance of others. Amen. Not only that, but he allows us to see the error of our insufficiency. Oh, yes, he does. Notice what the Bible says in verses 6 through 10. He says, and in my prosperity. See, sometimes God blesses you, right? God blesses you. He gives you a good job. He gives you, you know, you know, everything that you need. And, you know, those are blessings from God. We want that. Though. We appreciate it, right? Can I get a something, something on that? Yeah, we want to be blessed by God. But you see, what happens is, sometimes in your prosperity, you can forget God. And we always say, don't forget where you came from, right? right? Don't forget where you came from. See, David began to forget where he came from. See, as we hold David up in high esteem, we have to also understand that in his humanness, he had a lot of issues, just like he was me. Yeah. Yes, in his uh, you see, outward prosperity, through outward prosperity, sometimes we are prone, we're prone to sing praises to ourselves. Look what I did. Look what I got. Oh yeah, I'm making six figures and, you know, and, and on and on and on and, you know, I got this and I got that and I got all this stuff set up. I'm just here to say, be it a healthy body. Be it the enjoyment of affluence of the temporal things. We can begin to attribute that stuff to us. Help us now. Yeah, I'm working hard. I got a good job. I got a promotion. Yeah, well, that's good. <coughs> Praise God for that. Yeah. See, he allows us to realize the tragic consequences of our sin. Again, when he never the, those people. He never the army, right? Mm -hmm. And now, as he finished, and then even before the count was done, God began to convict him. His heart convicted him. He couldn't sleep at night. He knew, he knew he had sinned against God. He knew he was putting the military might of his army above, above God's ability to give him a victory. Oh, yes. And so, therefore, it resulted in his repentance. As he began to look and see thousands, can you imagine 70,000 people slaughtered because of you? Thousands upon thousands upon thousands just dropping dead, being slaughtered and slain by the death angel because of your sin. And they even begin to see the magnitude, the magnitude of his sin. The consequences of his sin, it brought him to repentance. You see, God wants us to realize uh, that God gives and God will take away. 
He can take it away. If you begin to reject God, ignore God, to forget God, He can begin to take those things away that He gave you. Someone said, if you don't use it, you lose it. God may even remove His head to protection. You see, uh, you can't produce your own security. You can't produce your own grace. That's right. See, grace is something that God bestows upon you. And so, many times we begin to think that we have done this on our own. That we, I got this. And if God moves his hand of protection from around you, you're now vulnerable. You're vulnerable to whatever the world throws at you. And all those men who just start dying before David, he realized that the protection was gone. See, sometimes the Bible says, you know, God can hide his face from you. And you know, Isaiah said, Behold, the arm of the Lord is not short, short that he cannot save, nor is he dull that he cannot hear. But he had taken the heads of from around you. He has turned his face towards you. Sometimes he has to remove himself so you can see how it feels to be out there by yourself. To be out there all alone. Oh, you thought you had it, right? But now when God's presence is removed, you're now vulnerable to the wolves. To those, to, to the slayers who are out to make prey of you. Oh yes, he hid his face from him. And therefore, David had to resolve to turn to the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 talks about godly sorrow brings forth a change. <clears throat> it brings forth repentance. Sometimes you have to, to get out there by yourself to realize what it means to be by yourself. Like the person who had an issue with God, as he looked back over time and saw only one set of footprints. He thought he was all by himself. In his own sufficient, you know, God, that's what I need you to do. I, I got through it by myself. I got through this. But I need you, God. In and of the fact that he couldn't even walk to make foot tracks in the sand. He could not even lift his foot. God had to pick him up and carry him. And sometimes we are oblivious to the fact that God is the one who's been giving you all this stuff. God is the one who's been blessing you. God is the one who's been keeping you. God is the one who's been protecting you. Giving you blessing upon blessing. It was God. It was God. It's not you. It's God. And now you want to take issue with God because you thought it was all about you. David came to the realization that his sin, his folly, had turned into catastrophe for not only him, but everybody around him. Family, his own loyal subjects were dropping like flags because of him. You see, peace and prosperity can sometimes seduce us. When you get everything going your way, everything seems to be smooth and comfortable, and we get so uh, uh, warm and fuzzy and cozy, just doing church stuff, just with us, never venturing out to where God really wants us to be. That, that, that sense of prosperity and sense of peace can seduce us into thinking that we are invincible. Mm -hmm. Seduce us into thinking uh, that we can do this by ourselves and therefore we put confidence in the flesh. Yeah. We put confidence in the flesh. God has to sometimes teach us that your strength will fail you. Man. Yeah, I don't care how young you are. I don't care how you know, buffed you are. I don't care how, you know, how good looking you are when you look in the mirror. God said, I can equalize this play with you. It's a, it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the name of God. Amen. But notice, David said, I rather fall into your hands rather than the hands of man. All right. He said, I would choose to be under your sword because if I'm under the sword of man, they would have no mercy. All the other armies of the nation couldn't wait to get a hold of David. He said, I will put my hands in your hand, God. All right. You judge me. Right. You give me punishment. 
And even if you kill me, I know that you are just in doing so. Amen. Can you put your trust in him? Even knowing that he's going to have to judge you. Sometimes when we get a spanking, do we, do we say, God, bring it on because I know I deserve this? <laughs> We're going to have an altar in one minute. <laughs> but finally, let me just leave you with this. This psalmist says, uh, we will sing praises to the Lord, thanking God for our deliverance, right? Because we, in that, we want to lift up our hearts to Him. We're going to extol Him. Because He is the one who, who, who removes uh, the punishment. He, even in His graciousness, allows us to see the error of our way so we can repent and come back to Him. Oh God, don't take away your spirit from me. Renew in me a right heart, a clean spirit. And I will be careful to teach sinners the error of their way. I will be careful to praise you. I will be careful to dedicate my life to you. He restores the joy of our salvation. The last two verses of this psalm, and the lesson will be yours. The last two verses simply say, Thou hast turned for me uh, my mourning into dancing. My mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and buried me with gladness Amen. to the end that my glory may sing praise to thee and not be silent. Oh my God, I will give thanks unto thee forever. He goes back to the beginning of the psalm to end the psalm. He begins by saying, I'm going to praise you, God. And he said, now, because of you done this, that, and the other, I'm going to praise you forever. When we understand the goodness, grace, and mercy of God, we want to praise Him forever. When we see uh, that He turned our morning into dancing, yeah. when we understand that God can change your situation. <clears throat> oh, yes, He can. You're in a situation that brings you hardship. You're in a situation that brings you distress. You're in a situation that brings you agony and torment. God can allow you to go through those things. Yes, uh, we may endure for the night, but one time to show your color. He said, I can change your, your, your funeral dirge into dancing. I can turn your sadness into gladness. I can restore the joy of your salvation. He said, I can do all of those things in my time of calamity and distress. I need to look up to the Lord in my time of pestilence. Uh, and nakedness. I need to be able to look up to God. In my time, when it seems like I'm just catching, where the kids at? I'm just catching it from all sides. That's the time. I need to say, God, I confess my fault before you. I give my life over to you. Deliver me from my calamity. And when he does, deliver you. When he does, pardon you. When he smiles on you, you need to take uh, whatever you got and build an altar mm -hmm. and praise God. Yeah. Build an altar and dedicate your life to God. Yeah. In 2016, can you build an altar as you look at how he brought you out of 2015? Yeah. Yeah. You may have just got, barely got out by the skin of your teeth, but you got out. Yeah. You ought to build an altar. You ought to dedicate your life to him because he's able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond anything you can even say to know at you. You can say, devil, bring it. Bring it. Because with me and God, we make a majority. And so therefore, in your time of darkness, uh, you ought to have some kind of tokens of humiliation. Some tokens of your repentance. My praise shall not be silent. My praise shall not be silent. I will give thanks unto thee forever. Why? Because now I realize that he brought me through. I realized that God is the one who's able to uh, make me so that no one else can break me. He's good. And so today we simply say, as a church, we sing praise to the Lord. As a church, we sing praises of celebration to the Lord. And when you say that you sing praises to the Lord, 
the natural progression is from singing praises to the Lord in celebration. It's to build an altar to the Lord in dedication. The church will glorify God when we not only sing praises in celebration, but we need to build an altar. Oh, yes. You need to build an altar. Now, what's your altar? I don't know. It may be the ministry that you're over. It may be the ministry that God wants you to be involved in and you just haven't got into it yet. We still, we're still on the outskirts in our relationship with God. God says, I want you all in. 2016, folks. 2016. Yes, we appreciate the fact that he brought us out last year. But what are you going to do this year? What is your altar? What is your dedication to the Lord? If this means anything to you, you know that God is good. Not only is he good, but his mercy endures forever. Therefore, we ought to praise him forever. Can you praise God today? Can you pray? Can you sing a song? The new song? The song of the Lamb? That only the redeemed can sing? Only those who are on the highway to holiness can sing? The song that, the, the, the road that no sinner can try? Only the righteous can walk on this highway. Only the redeemed can walk on this highway. You ought to want to take a stroll on the highway to holiness. Because it is the holy God who empowers and enables us to be there. If you want to be there, you need to understand that it's a very simple thing. It's not a legal transaction. It's a grace. It's a grace calling. In other words, Jesus loves you so much that he died for you. He's the one who paid the price that you couldn't pay. Because you owe a debt. He didn't owe the debt, but he still paid the price for you. That's love. That's the embodiment of love. He loved you so much that he died on the cross. That was when he was on the cross. You know the hill called Golgotha. Okay? It was outside the city of Jerusalem. Had to take the sin outside the camp. And so therefore, he embraced the sin. So you can now come into the camp. Because your sin has been washed away. When you appropriate his death to your life. If he died, he was buried, he rose again the third day. Oh, yes, he did. If he did not rise, then we could not receive the Spirit of God. If he did not die, we still lost in our sins. If he did not die and raise again, we're all being most miserable. But because he rose again, we can have life. Now, here's the kicker right here. How do you appropriate that to your life? How do you embrace the death? Now, how do you... Receive the benefits of his death. Well, by faith, we do what's called obeying the gospel. Mm -hmm. We hear the word of God. And when hearing that word has now brought about what we call regeneration, it moves us to look at our sins and say, God, just like David, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what I've done. I know the consequences of what I've done brought Jesus to the cross. I'm ready to repent and I want to change that. I want to turn to God. Because I'm confessing that I believe that Jesus Christ is indeed God in the human body. He came to earth so that he could die for me. That's what I can get for him. And now I'm ready to be buried in the watery grave of baptism. Not as not with sign of inward grace, that's not even the Bible. But for the remission of my sins. So that I can now call upon the name of the Lord. Calling upon the name of the Lord is simply mean I'm appealing to God for good conscience. To wash my sins away is brought about the guilt. To wash my sins away so that I can now be adopted into the family of God. If you're here today and you know that you need prayer, if you know that you want to say thank you, God, for getting me through to see another year and another day, then we want to pray with you. We want to pray for you.
It's a time when I don't care what's going on in your life. You need Jesus. You need God in your life. And sometimes the first step is just to acknowledge that. Sometimes I just need to say, I need prayer. And yes, I pray by myself, but sometimes, do you not know that sometimes sin can be, can do a number on you? It can do a number on your life. Your circumstances can become so overwhelming that it makes your knees buckle. And you need somebody to come alongside of you to pray for you because you right at this moment can't pray for yourself. We want to do that. Even as our leaders come before us right now, I want to ask you, is there any area in your life that you need to give to God right now? Is there any situation in your life that's too big for you and you know you want to give it to God and you need to give it to God, won't you give it to God today? We're going to afford you an opportunity. If you need to be baptized for the remission of the sins, uh, we want to pray that that takes place. If you need to repent of whatever, you don't have to come and announce it to everybody. Everybody don't need to know the nuances of your business. But you need to pray. You need people to pray for you. We want to do that. We want to do it right now. Together we stand and sing a song of encouragement. We invite you to respond.